Okay, that's 11 o'clock. I've set my little timer to keep me on track. Welcome to Strategies for Effectively Leading Change. And we're going to take about 35, maybe 40 minutes for our conversation, pretty much being me to you, but with opportunities for you to participate in polls, chat box sessions, and so on. And then we'll try and leave a little bit of time at the end to handle any questions. So if you do have questions, please make a note of them and bring them forward uh, once we complete the uh, previous portion of the session. So strategies for effectively leading change. If I had to take this course and boil it down to a single word, that word would be communicate. Communicate in all directions, communicate with integrity and honesty, communicate, communicate, communicate. So I hope you've enjoyed this session. I'm just kidding, of course, we're going to go much deeper than that, but you're going to find a consistent theme of communication. So strategies for effectively leading change. Let's take that apart a little bit. Okay, why is this not moving? There we go. So the first item on there is strategy. So let's talk a little bit about strategy. What is strategy? Well, the Oxford English Dictionary says it's a plan of action designed to achieve a long-term aim or, or a long-term goal or overall aim. Hmm. Let's see what uh, Miriam Webster has to say a careful plan or method for achieving a particular goal, usually over a long period of time. So the commonality there is a goal or an aim and usually over a long period of time. Well, one of the questions right away is what's a long period of time? And that depends on the organization and the individuals. In many organizations, we can consider six months, a short term, and beyond that, a long term. But whatever is set for you is reasonable. So let's take a look now at leadership and leading. So what is leadership? And again, let's go back to our previous sources here. So back to the Oxford, this time to the reference dictionary. And they say that transformational leaders are deemed to have the qualities of charisma inspirational vision, intellectual stimulation, and a willingness to offer individualized support and encouragement to their followers. And now from someone else, this is from John Cotter, who is a absolutely monumental thinker in change. And this is from his book, Leading Change, that leadership is a set of processes that creates organizations in the first place and adapts them to significantly changing circumstances. Leadership defines what the future should look like, aligns people with that vision and inspires them to make it happen despite the obstacles. Wow, that's a pretty solid definition from my point of view. So then what's change leadership? You know, specific leadership around change and John Cotter kind of forecast this a little bit. So it's a dynamic process, meaning it's an interactive process, a changing process. We don't have a stock solution that press the red button and everything works every time. But it's a process that leverages two-way communication. So what's two-way communication? It's when as a communicator, we both transmit information and we receive information. And by having received that information, we use it to then interpret whether or not our transmitted information was correctly received and whether we need to try again. The two-way communication could begin with it being a communication direct or indirect from the people that we're working with. And it might not be something as simple as the vocal communication of someone coming up to us and saying, yeah, I think this stinks, but rather other ways that people send that message. 
It's a dynamic process that leverages engagement activities to bring forward the awareness of the change. It's a dynamic process that leverages things to ensure readiness, that we give people the time and opportunity to prepare for change, that we provide them with the training for change. We give them the confidence for change, and that's our final one here, a dynamic process that instills confidence through empowerment and participation to achieve that desired future state. So if we think about the last three minutes, we've been talking about communication at all levels. So what does it mean, change leadership? Well, here we are in the current state where we are today. And we're no longer happy with being where we are today, either because of our desires or because of things that have happened that are changing our world. Where do we want to be? We want to be at the future state or desired state. So that's pretty easy. Let's just go there. Ah. Not so easy because between that current state and the desired state are a number of items, four key elements that we need to think about. Barriers, what are the things that are holding us back, making it impossible for us to get to the desired state? Do we need new tools? Do we need new processes? Do we need to restructure our organization? Are there barriers in terms of staff capability? Barriers in terms of management capability? Barriers, it can be anything that is going to block or make our way difficult from the current state to the desired state. Context, you know, why is this change happening? And, if we can provide context to people so they understand not just that this is happening, but why it's happening, it makes their acceptance of change much more likely. We need processes. How are we going to move from our current position to our desired position, from that current state to the desired state? And ah, we have to think about people because we can achieve nothing by ourselves. We achieve things with the cooperation and participation of other people. So who do we need to communicate with? Who do we need to lead through this change? Who do we need to bring from current to desired state? Well, all of those four things, oops, there we go. These four elements, barrier, context, process, and people are part of leading change. And if we do a good job there, if we bring the people along with us, we can arrive at the desired state. So let's do a poll. Let's take a look at which of the following obstacles has been the most common and impactful through your change initiatives, resistance, communication breakdowns and lack of clarity, insufficient time and support or unclear changing vision, priorities or direction. So I'm going to launch that poll now and you can choose the one that is most resonant with you. So we've got the poll open now. I'll leave it up for about uh, 15 or 20 seconds. Wow, the votes are coming in fast and furious here. Almost 50% have voted. So if you haven't voted, go ahead and vote. We'll give you another five seconds. Okay, I'm going to close the poll. And the results in the lead unclear or changing vision priorities or direction with 34% of the votes that were cast. Then communications breakdown and lack of clarity at 28%, resistance at 26, and insufficient time or support at 12%. Excellent. Okay, let's move right along here. So common obstacles to change, and this is from a Harvard Business Review study, and it says leaders can influence, improve 
the three items that are circled here. Employee resistance, leaders can have an effect on that. Breakdown in communication, leaders can have an effect on that. And staff turnover during transition, leaders can have an effect on that. So a leader's support of the training is critical to employee readiness for the change. And being careful here not to give out any identifying details, I worked with a client not too long ago who asked me to come in and help with a transformational change. And when I arrived there, I found that they were already so deep into the, the path of change and it was an IT implementation that was coming down the path and it was going to be done on the day that had been planned for regardless of the circumstances. And well, their solution was just cram it in, make people use it. Would that work well? No. What should have happened was thinking earlier on and engaging people. And I said to them, if you do that, we are going to have tremendous resistance because we're not walking people through the path. We're just jumping them to the end and saying, deal with it. And they said, oh, we expect 50% of the people to leave. And they accepted that as a cost in their project. After that conversation, we determined that perhaps I wasn't the right person to, to be there and be the cram them into. So three critical strategies we can talk about. First of all, effective change sponsorship from engaged leaders. And we're going to dive deeper in each of these areas over the next 30 minutes or so. Expect, understand, and address change resistance. And the third one, early and ongoing two-way communications. So let's take a look at these. Start with number one, effective change sponsorship from engaged leaders. So when we think about that, things we need to worry about, ensuring clarity about the change. Not just, hey, change is coming, but what is the change that's coming? Do people understand the change? One of the things that is unvaryingly true, if we thrust change to, upon people without explaining the rationales and the reasons and the drivers behind it, there will be higher resistance. Assessing change readiness. Are people ready for this? Communicating what the plan is for change management. Leaders need to inspire trust. And how do we inspire trust? Well, perhaps the most succinct explanation of that I ever heard from someone who said, inspiring trust is achieved by saying what you're going to do and then doing it. But deep trust is achieved when you do that, but you also say what you will not do, and then you don't do it. It's about integrity. Building momentum for the change. If we wait until the two days before the change is going to occur, we can't work up that momentum. But if we start two months, six months, a year out, and inform people along the way, we can bring them with us. We need to engage with our stakeholders. You cannot over-engage. Well, that's not quite true. You can over-engage, and of the two things that you can do wrongly, either by over-engaging or under-engaging, I will always over-engage. Right? As leaders, we have to model the change. We have to show that our actions match our words. Because if we don't model the change, if we make everyone else change, but we can stay the way it was, the hypocrisy rings loudly and it affects people's ability to move forward. We need to provide support and we need to remove obstacles. The very best change managers and change leaders see the obstacles in advance and move ahead and remove the obstacles so that they're never affecting the people undergoing the change. Perhaps the 
best statement of our change leadership I know comes from thousands of years ago. Lao Tzu in China said, bad leaders push people from behind. Good leaders pull people from the front. But the great leader walks among the people. And when the change has occurred, the people say, we did this ourselves. And if you have that level of engagement in the change that we did this ourselves, resistance melts to a large extent and acceptance and uptake it grows rapidly. So we have different layers of leadership. Let's take a look at some of the roles. The number one contributor to change success according to a ProSci benchmark report from 2009 is visible leader participation and executive commitment drives this. If we have good, visible, ongoing, steady commitment by the executives to this, the employees' perceptions of the change become more positive and acceptance and engagement increase. Senior managers straddle two change roles. They're trust, they should be trusted leaders, understanding the rationale for the business to make this change and the strategic value of the change. And those are not always things that are, that are readily apparent to others if we don't share that information. And they need to be the trusted manager who appreciates and understands what does this mean to operations? How is it going to affect the way we move forward? The role of the one level up, you know, the direct person that someone reports to is absolutely critical because it's at this point that the interface between leadership and follower takes place. So, Basically, in the world of communication about change, there's two people that really want to be heard by the, the people who are facing change. And the person from which they want to get the how the change is going to impact them, the workplace, and what they're going to do about it is their direct one level up. Now, when we're talking about the what is going to change and the why it's going to change, often the higher we can go in the tree, the better we have there because that's in illustrating that executive level of commitment. Back to the one level up. They need to manage the pace and the scope of the change so that it meets the needs of their people. They need to support the employees throughout the change, having that open communication, having people have the opportunity to walk in and ask for perhaps a closed door session and say, here are the things that frighten me. Here are the things I don't think make sense. Here are the things that I don't think are going to work and engage on that and help the employee move forward. We need to remember that change and fear are practically the same thing in most people's minds. Right? And here, the modeling that must take place, that one level up must be actively display the changes in behavior and process and so on that are desired for the others because the employees will pick up on the attitude and actions of that one level up so much so that if we have a one level up who is resistant to the change everyone who works for that person will also be resistant So let's move into our next piece to expect, understand, and address change resistance. So let's talk about how people react to change. And what you see in front of you is a classic bell curve. Over here, we have the supportive group, and by golly, you'll know it's pretty little. Way over here on the other side, the resistant group, and happily, it's also pretty little. And look at this great big piece here in the center, the neutrals. Well, <laughs> the neutrals could go either way. They could become supportive, 
or they could become resistant depending on how they're treated. So in terms of the, their reactions benefits to the change, you know, supportive is positive, resistant is negative, and the neutrals are in the middle. So when we think about how we're going to deal with resistance, a lot of us say, well, we must spend all of our energy on the resistant people. In reality, where we need to spend our energy is on the neutrals, who could become supportive and who could become resistant. And in fact, we could split the neutrals into the early majority and the late majority, because as soon as half of the people have become supportive, that is now a positive majority for the change. The other wait and sees, the other neutrals, will flow with that majority. And so will some of the resistors. Don't get me wrong. And we'll talk about some techniques about resistance. But there will always be some who will continue to be resistant. And I'll be perfectly frank. In any major change, there are people who choose to remove themselves from the change. I spent a lot of my life teaching skydiving. And one of the things I saw was as equipment changed from the round parachutes to the square parachutes and then to the even higher performance elliptical parachute, that at each time, some people chose not to move forward. A friend of mine who had been a world champion, a, a medalist at the world meet under the round parachutes, kept jumping her favorite round parachute. But over the course of a few years, she came out less and less because everyone else was moving into the new technology and she felt alone. And eventually she just stopped jumping. So in terms of the percentages here, supportive and resistant, you know, on a classic bell curve fashion here are about 16% each. The neutrals, the wait and sees, about 68%. So we can see that definitely if we can tip this piece over to the supportive side, how much it's going to give us. So take a second and think about your own reaction to change. Are you an initiator? Are you an advocate? Are you part of that wait and see passive resistance? Mm -hmm. Not able to lead change as well as you should, don't deny your own feelings because your feelings are as valid as anyone else's. And you now we won't go down this rabbit hole very far, but we tend to think of ourselves as people of rationality. In reality though, we're people of emotion. And the, the way I think of it is my rational self is a mouse sitting on top of the emotional elephant that really drives me around. So, what can you do if you don't support the change? If you can't support the change, or perhaps you just don't support the change at this point. So, in the chat box, Go ahead and put in a word or two. What can you do if you don't support the change? Where's my chat box? Hmm. Find out why I can't support it. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Look for another job. Whoa, okay. Try and understand the change. Mm -hmm. Just keep my head down. They'll make the, another change next week. Whoa, okay. I've been in that organization as well. So let's take a, a second here and think about change. Imagine you have decided you want to sell your house and move. And you say to yourself, I'm going to take 90 days and see what I can find. And how do you feel? Probably a little excited, probably a little bit 
anxious and you start looking for houses and it stays kind of exciting and a little bit anxious. Now imagine you came home tonight and you find a notice from the Ministry of Transport saying this area is going to be incorporated into the new superhighway and you have 90 days to vacate. Uh, we will pay you absolute market value. So the dollars aren't at issue, but how do you feel now? Are you, woohoo, great, a change? Or is it, they can't make me do that? For most of us, it would be, they can't make me do that, even though, of course, they can. And what's the difference here? In one case, we have our hands on the levers of control. After starting at 90 days, we might decide at day 45, I'm going to stop looking for another house because I haven't seen anything I like more than my current house. But in the second one, you don't get that choice. Now, not all resistance is the same. You know, we tend to see it as kind of a, a just a mass of resistance, but it breaks out into pieces. So we can see, you know, there are groups or subgroups within the resistance. And by far the largest resistance group is caused by people not being aware of the change or only aware of the fact that there's going to be a change, but not the reasons why and so on. The next largest group, it's people who can't do the change right now because we haven't given them the training or they feel they don't have the abilities. Well, both of those are actually addressable because the unawareness we can address by communicating better. The unable we can address by providing the training and experiences necessary to make them able. And then we have the refuse group where they simply say, I don't want to. On a change I was doing for a major government ministry where we were taking away things that had been used for more than 30 years, systems and processes and so on, and collapsing more than 50 legacy systems into a single integrated system, the first change readiness survey came back with fr phrases on it like, I'm retiring in two years. Can you wait? You can't make me learn this. Things like that. Well, these were in the perhaps you refuse. But even in the refuse, if we can engage them well, perhaps we will move them to being saying, well, I, could, I would do it, but I can't. We can address that. Or... I didn't even know this was happening or what I heard was that it was all going to be outsourced to a private contractor and we were all losing our jobs. So it's all about communication. So how can we mitigate change resistance? Well, we can look at why are they resistant. We can watch for the subtle, often unstated change resistant signs and come up with plans for how do we move people from the top of that triangle we just saw into the middle and eventually into the bottom layer, perhaps, and then completely out of the triangle. Don't let me kid you, this isn't easy. Some of the signs of change resistance, I'm just going to let you go ahead and read these as I bring them up. So common signs. So those common signs, have you seen them? Give me a thumbs up if you've seen something like that. Yes, lots of thumbs coming up. Okay, so now let's take a look at sort of passive resistance pieces, things that are less overt, less in the open. Sammy, I see you've raised your hand. Uh, if you have a question, please hold it till the end, okay? So how about the passive resistance? 
Have you seen passive resistance? Have you dealt with that? Because I can promise you it's out there. So think for a second now about the two kinds of resistance we have here, the open and the passive. Which of those is worse, do you think? The common signs in the open or the passive signs, the resistance that is quietly done? Where is my chat? So I'm going to leave that as a thought bubble for you. Which is worse? Because it depends perhaps on a number of factors. So let's move forward now into mitigating resistance. or approaches rather to managing resistance. So one, we need to explain the need for the change. We've covered a lot of this already. We need to consult and negotiate. Don't come in and just demand, but rather work with people. What's doable? Support and training can help us to manage resistance as can early involvement of people in the process. Almost every change management process in the after action report says we should have started earlier than this. Even if all we have to say is there are changes coming, pay attention, I'll get back to you with more when I can. That's better than leaving people to fear everything. That trust and security through honesty and integrity, assess readiness, anticipate reactions of the employees. How are they going to view this change? What I might think is great, others might not and invest the time necessary to build the commitment. And these are lovely to say, it's often very difficult to get organizations to put the information in and the effort in. So that's something the earlier we can start doing these things, the better off we will be. Okay, let's move into our third strategy, the early and ongoing two-way communication. So when we communicate change, we need to talk about why the change is happening. We need to give them the vision of what that desired state looks like and why they want to be there. We need to talk about what is going to change and also what is not going to change. We should have a formal change network so that people have someone to talk to about this. And we need a feedback loop so that we find out whether or not our communications are effective. You know, in today's world where we're mostly working remotely, that feedback loop has become far, 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 far more difficult. I can't just sit in the cafeteria for an hour or two and listen to what people are saying about the change. Or maybe send somebody who's not identified with the change to sit in the cafeteria for an hour or two and listen and get the, the pulse in our remote world, far more difficult to do. So things we need to do in communicating change, we need to provide direction. We need to be present and we need to address people's need to know. And if we can do that in ways that are interesting and fun, that is really worth our while. Communication doesn't have to be simply a email, a site on our web. You know, if you give some thought to it, you can find ways to reach people. So let's take a look at some of the things we need to do in communicating change. So we can think of four steps. We need to inform people, we need to educate people, we need to support people, and we need to commit to people. So in the inform step, you know, Again, this is where we share the vision and talk about the reasons behind the change. Okay. Create a sense of urgency. Okay. This is going to happen and we need to be prepared. Okay. We need to share what can be shared of the business case for change. And we need to emphasize that things are going to happen. Uh, I'm not saying that you need to be a Viking and burn your boats when you arrive at the land that you're invading, but you do need to do something to clearly mark the fact that we are going forward. One client of mine, at the beginning of their transition to a new piece of software, 
They took all the manuals from the previous software, which they did not like very much, and they had a bonfire in their parking lot and burned it all. So kind of a Viking approach to things, but clearly indicating the old is done and we're moving into the new. We need to educate people. So what does that mean? It means that we need to bring them along. And partly that means we need to find out what do they need. And we have to also educate them about it's okay to feel fear. It's okay to be concerned. It's okay to wonder about things. You know, so we might use phrases like, I understand some of you might be feeling, and then you put the detail in there. But, you know, in order to, and then put your change in there, we are going to, and you tell them what's going to happen. And here it's very critical that you don't expand beyond reality. Don't say I'm going to send everybody on a two-week training course if the reality is they're going to get a half-day session. Because if you don't follow through, you'll lose the trust. Right? And the benefits of doing this are, and you tell them that so that they understand why we're going to do this change. Right? Change comes from all over the place. Some we bring upon ourselves, some is thrust upon us. So then, you know, our next step is supporting people. So how can we support? Well, we can talk about the change with people in group or in one-on-one, -on -one. you know, what are the meanings and the impacts of the change for that group or that individual? And then being engaged, hearing what they say and responding to it, we can address the issues and concerns, maybe not right now, and there's never a problem with saying, you know, I don't have an answer to that right now, but I will find it out and come back, provided that you find it out and come back. Or if you can't find it out, that you at least come back. Again, trust is hard earned and easily lost. We need to, as change leaders, be confident about the, the change to come and that it's going to be properly supported. And we need to tie the benefits of the change for the organization and for the people into the support we give to individuals. This isn't support to stay where they are. This is support to help them move forward. And then committing. Step four. Right? So we need to continually do the first three steps here, the inform, the educate, and support. It's not a one and done. We're dealing with people and people will have new thoughts and new concerns and we need to bring them forward. Something I've done a lot of in the past is setting up kind of clinic hours where I'll set aside or have someone on my team set aside, you know, two hours every Wednesday afternoon. That is a walk-in clinic that people can just walk in and it's a one-on-one -on -one and we really strive to live to the concept of the change doctor, that what's said to us is in confidence. Now we will take general information, but I would not come back and say, and you won't believe folks what Sally said about this, right? We need to reinforce, keep reminding the benefits that are to come. Someone is keying, if you could just mute your, uh, your sound please, because it's kind of clackety clacking. So just take a fast look at your screens and if you're not muted, please mute. We need to provide recognition for those that are doing well on the change and the team that's doing well on the change. So we recognize and celebrate successes. And one of the big secrets, ask people for their support. All of us want to be helpful. If we ask someone to say, can you support this change with me? You know, you might get a lukewarm piece, but a lukewarm piece is the beginning of a fully warm piece. Okay. Looking at the clock here, we're coming against my 40 minute limit before questions. So let's do a quick sum up. So three principal strategies. Effective change sponsorship from engaged leaders, and that's leaders at all levels. Expect, understand, and address change resistance. 
and I'm going to be frank with you here. I try not to in my own projects. I'm using resistance here because it's a common word. I think of it as change reluctance because a lot of it's not deeply rooted. It's just, but I don't know why I want to do that. And finally, the last one that we had, just let me turn off that timer, <laughs> is early and ongoing two-way communications. And that brings us to the end of this presentation, leaving us five minutes for questions and answers. So if you have a question, just go ahead and put it into the chat box. So Sammy, I noted you had a hand up earlier. Would you uh, like to unmute and ask your question? Actually, you answered already. I, I really appreciate uh, the presentation. Very well done and I really enjoy it. Thank you well, very thank much. Well, thank you, Sammy. Thank you very much. Hannah, your hand is up. Would you care to unmute and speak? Oh, maybe Hannah's been pulled away. Okay, so the, just go ahead and if you'd like to, uh, to raise a question, just uh, put your hand up and then uh, we'll work our way through that list. There's also a number of questions in the chat box, if you can see that. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, it's disappeared on me. Where would I find the chat box? Um, so it should be in the panel at the bottom where you can... Um, yeah. It says chat there. So if you just click on that, it may open as a separate window. Um, but I can also read the questions okay. to you. Yeah, that, that's them. probably the, the best thing because I did have it earlier, but uh, when I shut it, uh, when I minimized it, it, it uh, minimized to zero. <laughs> there you go. I mean, it, it always happens while you're presenting, doesn't it? Okay, so yep. <laughs> one of the questions is, oops, it's kind of moving around on me. Um, can you please share any techniques, approaches that might help the change leader not to burn out in a toxic culture? Okay, wow, that's a massive question and a really good one. So basically, Self-care is critical. So you need to build in for yourself some grounding times to let the toxins flow out. And for me, what works on that is little mini meditations, like something as simple as taking a two minute uh, you know, quiet space. I close my eyes and relax and I focus on breathing. It's like in, two, three, four, five. Out, two, three, four, five. And even having done just that one, I am now more relaxed than I was two minutes ago. And you might even hear it that my voice is a little less tense. And interestingly, if you see a first responder sitting in their vehicle with their eyes closed and just quietly breathing, this is how they're trained now to release the stress of the call they've just come from because they deal with a lot of stuff that none of us want to have to deal with. And if they let it build up, it can eat them as well. So whatever kind of self-care you can come up with. Um, I joke that previously for me, it was coffee all day long and wine all night long. That's not a healthy strategy. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> awesome. Um, so we have a comment here just saying, um, oops, moved again on me one sec. Um, love uh, the practical approach and the walk-in clinic concept. And there is a question about present copies of the presentation, which was answered that we will receive it by email yep. um, or the recording at least. Mm -hmm. um, can you differentiate between a change project and the, the turbulence we are experiencing during COVID? So we, if we think about a change project as being a known desired change and moving forward into it, whereas in turb the turbulence right now around COVID is massive. You know, I feel so bad for restaurant owners having been shut down for so long, then told they can open up if they spend a whole bunch of money making changes. And then a month later are told, oh, you're going to shut back down again. 
um, that kind of froth is is really unhealthy. Now, we have seen some moving forward with the statement of, okay, well, here's how we're going to make these decisions rather than just hearing, oh, today we're making this decision. So all changes bring frustration. Even the changes that we we want for ourselves and we start for ourselves bring frustration at some point because change is difficult. But the lack of control that we feel in COVID is really disconcerting for people. And we need to, to work that in. You know, the, the fact that we've all learned to do things remotely over the last four or five months uh, mm -hmm. is a big change. Right now, I'm on a change project where I would normally be, you know, hanging out in the hallway and having coffee with people. And to get that same level of interaction uh, on a video link is very tough. Okay, we probably have time for one more and then we're going to have to wrap it up. Okay, um, I'm trying to, there's a lot of very, very positive comments. So I will say that you can't see them, but there, there's tons of them. Um, any other questions? I don't think so. Oh, um, oh, sorry. Um, nope, never mind. What do you do with the PM um, if uh, who uh, do not believe in change management? That was the question. What do you do with PM? So that's, again, a, a, a really good question. And I find the more technical, the, I'm painting with a very broad brush here, but the, the, I find the more technical the project, the more the PMs tend to think, well, we'll just take away the old computers. They'll have to use the new ones. That doesn't work. So my question to them is, what if you do all this and then people don't use it? Right? What if you do this and people all go to different places, you know, move to other jobs? It becomes a time when you really need to spend time working with them on the inform and the education portions of that communicating a change initiative and realize that the project manager is a stakeholder as well. And depending on the organization, you might be in a peer relationship or you might be kind of a provided services relationship and all of these things come into play. At the end of the day, if I was totally unable to influence this individual, I would have to go to the person I'm working for or if possible, if we're both in the same project, go to the sponsor and say, this isn't not just this is bad, but this is a problem because here is what it's going to do to our project. Okay, well, we're into the uh, the intercession period here. Thank you all very much for being here and for your attention. And I hope you can find something to take away from this. And remember, if all else fails, communicate, communicate, communicate. In all portions of your life, we're, we're bad communicators everywhere. If we were better at communicating, our world would be a smoother and happier place. So I wish you well. Take care. <laughs>